Okay, um, it is uh, just a little bit after four o'clock and it's time to get started. Um, welcome everybody uh, to um, CNI's first virtual meeting and it's opening virtual plenary. Um, it's certainly a uh, very different world than uh, what we imagined when we uh, first laid our plans for uh, San Diego. And um, there's a lot more we can, can and we certainly will be saying about that in the future. Um, today, I just want to say that I'm delighted you're all here. You're all hopefully well and safe and with us. Um, and uh, we, I hope you'll continue to engage with us over the course of this virtual meeting. Um, I just want to say, I know that all of you who are here have at least a pretty good understanding of um, how we're doing this virtual meeting because you wouldn't have gotten this far if you didn't. Um, I do just want to note that um, we will be doing the closing uh, virtual plenary tomorrow at the same time. Um, we had a very successful executive roundtable uh, earlier today, and we'll have another one tomorrow. Um, and the reports on that should be quite interesting. Um, uh, we, we have had quite a good discussion of recent events at that. Uh, um, and how those have changed strategies for acquiring um, teaching and learning materials. Uh, we will be adding um, a few additional things that weren't part of the original plan for the um, for the uh, um, San Diego meeting. We'll be reaching out to member reps to um, participate in another um, extra um, executive roundtable, and uh, we'll also be calling for um, a few additional presentation slots uh, on late breaking events. So um, uh, watch for those um, and we'll keep you posted. I don't really want to say much more at this point um, other than um, uh, once again, to say I'm glad you're with us, and um, uh, we will be reaching out to you to try at the end of this virtual meeting to learn as much as we can about what worked and what didn't work for future planning and um, to help us understand different kinds of events we might be able to do in the future, including perhaps some things that have hybrid um, uh, in-person and uh, virtual components. Um, with that, uh, let me just say two or three quick mechanical things, and then I'm going to introduce uh, our Rob. Um, we are doing this, I, I suspect many of you are intimately familiar with Zoom at this point, having spent most of your life in it for the last uh, week or more. Um, we are doing this technically in what is um, Zoom webinar mode as opposed to Zoom meeting mode, which means everybody has come in muted um, except for our speakers. Um, and um, uh, aren't generating video, which will cut down uh, the load on the poor overworked internet a little bit. Um, if you have questions, um, the best thing to do is use the Q&A tool. Um, and um, we'll do questions at the end of the meeting. Um, we're not going to try and deal with raised hands as we go. That's just a little bit too complicated. Um, at the end of the meeting, after, after we complete the formal Q&A um, <coughs> and uh, presentation, Rob has agreed to stay around for a few minutes if um, any of you want to chat informally with him. Um, so uh, if, if you do, um, there'll be a, a brief opportunity for that at the end of the meeting. So. With that, let me introduce our plenary speaker. Dr. Rob Sanderson. Um, I was trying to remember when I first met Rob. 
Um, I believe it was in Liverpool, if my memory serves me, um, quite some years ago when he was working on this amazing um, PhD dissertation. Um, you may not know it, those of you who know Rob, particularly for his technical um, work, um, but he is also a really serious digital humanist um, who has done really serious digital humanities work. Um, uh, and um, uh, um, he, did a, he did just an amazing uh, dissertation, um, which sort of uh, foreshadowed a whole lot of things that have happened since in uh, how manuscripts have uh, migrated to the web as these multi-layered documents. Um, after finishing up in um, the UK, he came over to the US. He spent time um, at Los Alamos with um, Herbert von de Sample's team there, um, and uh, then uh, did a stint at um, Stanford, uh, where he um, was very instrumental in uh, getting uh, the um, international image interoperability framework off the ground and um, you know he really um, did a tremendous amount of cross-pollinating um, across various projects and silos at Stanford and then about um, four years ago now I believe he came to the Getty as their first um, semantic architect and um, you know, it's worth reflecting just for a minute on what kind of an amazing institution creates a position in the early 21st century called semantic architect um, and what that says about how the world of cultural heritage is changing. Um, as you'll hear from Rob, uh, it's changing, but it needs to change a whole lot more. Um, and uh, he's going to give you some, I think, really important insights uh, into that. Um, before turning it over to Rob, um, and I'll, I'll materialize back at the end to help the questions flow, um, I just want to express my profound thanks to him for working with us through all of this uncertainty and complexity um, and uh, just being willing to be here for us under very different circumstances uh, to do this plenary. So many, many thanks to you. Virtual applause from everyone and welcome. Over to you. Great, thank you, Cliff. <clears throat> and thank you everyone um, for joining in these, uh, well, hopefully uniquely challenging times. Uh, thank you also to all of my colleagues, um, some of whom Cliff mentioned, who are on the sample uh, at Los Alamos, Tom Kramer at Stanford, and Lily Fragile, David Newbury at the GC, um, and all of my, my colleagues um, in the communities, AAAF, the W3C, and so forth, because this presentation really just repackages a lot of the work that has gone on over the last 20 years in cultural heritage uh, and research data. Um, and Equally, um, I would like to beg your forgiveness uh, and understanding um, as the virtual guinea pig um, for this new world that we find ourselves in. So, um, there's no need, of course, to justify uh, access to research data to, to this crowd. And it's in the name of the coalition, after all. So what I would like to talk about um, is instead some of the challenges that we have in the cultural heritage sector about data uh, and publishing cultural heritage data across diverse institutions um, and diverse subdomains uh, with multiple modes of access uh, and multiple quite inconsistent uh, audiences. But one that I will argue uh, we can approach in an in, in incremental fashion. And of course, particularly these days with uh, financial and social stresses on the system, and um, how we can improve the situation for such um, a research data ecosystem to be more sustainable uh, and more accessible at the same time. So everyone has some understanding of cultural heritage, of course, um, and your thoughts, 
uh, when I mention that uh, topic, might go to beautiful paintings such as this Rembrandt housed in the Getty Museum. Or it might go to photographs. Uh, here, a photograph taken um, by Ed Ruscha in his Streets of Los Angeles um, series. But when we go to look for that photograph online, because it's housed in the Getty Research Institute, the interface that we are presented with is very different from the interface that we'd be presented with if that exact same photograph was housed in the Getty Museum. Here, we have the representation of the um, series in which that photograph is part uh, in the Getty Research Institute's library interface. And you'll note at the top that it's available in the special collections, blah, 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 please contact the reference desk, and a finding aid. If we click through to that finding aid, we get yet another very different interface. So here, the creator, or the author at the bottom, Beth Angain, uh, is the person responsible for the finding aid, rather than the artist who is listed at the top as a collector. So why do we have these vast differences, even within a single institution? I would argue that there are, um, it is because of the diversity of the subcultures within the cultural heritage domain, and also the scale of the collections that we manage in those various subdomains. So libraries, of course, have many, many non-unique information carrying objects, books. This means that there is a chance for copy cataloging uh, and a very rich environment um, replete with standards. Archives have many unique information carrying objects. So the archival content uh, is most accessible in its uh, massive scale. So um, this means that cataloging is often at the collection level rather than at the single item level. This has also meant that the standards are intended to describe the collections typically and not to describe the individual objects, even if they are unique. Museums have, compared to archives and libraries, relatively few objects. They are all relatively unique. But instead of carrying information and text, they typically carry some sort of image, be that a photograph, a print, a drawing, a painting, or even um, you could imagine a sculpture carrying some image content. Uh, the museum domain, conversely, has a very um, low number of standards, um, and uh, that's one era, area where uh, we'll, we'll discuss further uh, in this presentation. I know that cultural heritage is often described as libraries, archives, and museums, sometimes adding gardens or galleries for glam. I would also like us to consider conservation and conservation science uh, as, part of, uh, as uh, part of cultural heritage. So conservation science is traditionally less concerned about metadata and more uh, traditionally concerned about scholarly communication. So how can they communicate uh, their findings about the conservation activities that they are performing. Now, this is very stereotypical, uh, and there are, of course, many exceptions that I'm sure everyone is shouting at their screens about. Um, one example would be Yale's Beinecke Rare Book Library, uh, which might be thought of more like a museum because the objects are, um, are more unique uh, than a typical library. The point is that we need to take into account cultures and practices of the various subdomains when we are thinking about access to research data for um, the cultural heritage industry. So when it comes to industry, we might think of ourselves, or we do think of ourselves according to this uh, only N equals 33 Twitter poll, uh, as part of the knowledge industry, you know, with a, a smattering of entertainment, warehousing, uh, and technology. But when it comes to what we do on a daily basis, that knowledge industry decreases way down below 50%. We spend our limited resources as cultural heritage organizations for very different purposes. So not only are there various uh, subdomains with different practices and different cultures, there are different, uh, very diverse objects uh, and collections that we need to deal with 
cultural heritage organizations are not primarily research organizations. We need to balance the publication of knowledge and data with being um, amenable and attractive to the general populace, um, the entertainment side. We need to deal with looking after our collections, warehousing. And particularly these days where no one can visit those collections in person, we also need to be attuned to technology needs. So what is then a vision that can include and position research in a practical, achievable manner alongside these other requirements? So how about something like our diverse cultural heritage is digitally available and easily usable, we'll come back to the usability a lot this talk, by sustainable application to further public engagement and research. So to this end, I think there are three core challenges and the colors here um, delineate the sections of the presentation. Um, there is the diverse and inconsistent data that we publish due to the intentionally diverse, the welcomely diverse uh, collections that we have uh, and the less welcomely inconsistent way that we um, look after them and describe them. There is a plurality of access methods uh, for the multiple audiences that we are trying to simultaneously serve. And like many industries, there is a lack of strategy around sustainability uh, for those products. We might also consider this as three core requirements, being shared abstractions that lead to sustainable implementations that lead to satisfied audiences. So without shared abstractions, we can never speak the same language. Our data will always remain inconsistent. Without sustainable implementations, we won't be able to keep it available. And unless we satisfy our audiences, we will never be able to prove to the people with the purse strings that we need to continue to do this. So on to uh, the, the first part, the purple part, um, how to manage um, our data. So how do we get shared abstractions across a very diverse set of subdomains? And the way that I've been thinking about this, um, and again, as part of discussions and collaborations uh, with many people, um, is this tripartite structure. So we have first a conceptual model, uh, which is the abstract way that we can think about the domain uh, in its entirety. So we need to think about the domain using conceptual models holistically. It can't be just per subdomain. Consistently, it needs to be um, broadly consistent across the entire domain and coherently we need to be able to apply logic to these sorts of things, if not necessarily inference. Further, we should have as few conceptual models as possible, because if we change the way that we are thinking about things, or people th are thinking about uh, data in different ways, then that data will necessarily not be interoperable, and therefore we will not get to some degree of uh, consistent, accessible, sustainable ecosystem. However, just because we think about things in the same way doesn't mean that we need to write it down in the same way. So we can have multiple ontologies, which is the shared format that allows us to encode the thinking in a machine actionable way. I don't mean necessarily machine interpretable, and we'll come to audience later, but machine actionable. We need for machines to be able to process it, not necessarily understand it and draw inferences from it. And finally, we need vocabularies, which are the curated set of subdomain specific terms that can make that ontology more concrete for the particular subdomains. So today in our um, research systems, we tend to collapse all of these things down to one particular document or um, one particular standard, rather than separating them out and allowing them to be composed in different ways as appropriate to the particular use cases. So there's our first challenge. How can we think about things separately, describe them consistently, and use subdomain specific language or vocabularies uh, to talk about them? The goal of this abstraction layer has always been towards completeness. So we want to be able to express everything that anyone might want to document 
because the fear is if they can't, then they will go off and invent their own, you know, the XKCD's 16th standard. Or as my colleague Lily Bridgell likes to say, there should be no data left behind. And that applies equally to record instances where the goal for the individual records is correctness because errors in our records impact the confidence that the users have in the data that we are publishing which then impacts the reputation of the institution for publishing bad data uh, and the reliability of any research which has then been performed using that bad data however here is the issue the perfect is always the enemy of the good left unchecked this process of abstraction of mapping the existing records into these formats and of cleaning the data to be as uh, perfect as possible will consume all available time and effort and eventually no data will see the light of day. Meaning that we have wasted all of the time that we uh, have put into this, all of the resources that we have assigned to this work unless we can overcome this particular challenge. How can we do that? Well, um, there is a need for application profiles. Not everyone needs to know everything. There are particular subdomains, and within those subdomains, there are particular foci of interest and particular data sets that do not need the entirety of the model, the entirety of the ontologies or all of the vocabulary terms. So we can specialize this by selecting the appropriate abstractions and documenting that selection as an application profile. One such application profile uh, that uh, we are working on um, is the, sorry, I'm closing that, uh, the linked art um, model, um, which is a linked open usable data model for cultural heritage, which is collaboratively designed to work across organizations to be easy to publish uh, and easy to use in consuming applications. Our design principles focus primarily around usability and not about precision and completeness. We want consistency and we want to engender community by assuming that we can get to 90% of the use cases, not 100%, but only with 10% of the effort being put in. If you'd like to see more, then our new top level domain, .art, uh, has been immensely useful and the URI is, uh, is linked .art. In terms of community, uh, we have a wonderful set of people um, and institutions involved. So you can see some hopefully familiar museums uh, and collection owning system institutions on the left hand side there um, around, from around the world. And in the right hand column, there are research institutes, institutions such as uh, Yale and Oxford, but also aggregators uh, of information such as Europeana uh, and the Canadian Heritage Information Network. We are formalizing the profile in the International Council of, Museum, in, of Museums and are immensely grateful um, to the Crest Foundation in the States and to the Arts and Humanities Research Council uh, in the UK uh, for funding to be able to, um, to work on this project. <coughs> so on to the um, distinctions between access uh, and audience. So if the data is the what, the thing that we are interested in, then access is how, and audience is not who, but why. We don't really care who you are. We want to know why you are interested in having access to the data so that we can best serve your information needs. This partition then gives us a very useful split uh, between usability being the focus of the access part and use being the focus of the audience. However, it also underscores the need for partnership between the publisher of the data and the consumer, between the cultural heritage organization and the researcher. Why? Because the cultural heritage uh, organization cannot publish absolutely everything that they might want to, um, nor can uh, the researcher um, know that they will be able to get access to everything. But without some degree of collaboration, the Cultural Heritage Institute won't know what they should be publishing because they won't know the use that is intended for it. So we need a degree of partnership, um, particularly around use cases uh, from the audience and usability 
uh, from the side of the axis. Technically, how do we get access to data? Well, um, access to data is handled via APIs or agreements preceding interactions. And yes, semantic architects uh, and or pedantic architects, I do know that API really stands for application programming interface. So APIs are how programmers interact with data across system boundaries, but they are social contracts that we make with each other that by publishing an API, we say, this is how we are going to let you interact with our data. And we will maintain it in that way, such that when you write code, we won't go changing that API willy nilly uh, and breaking your code. So there is some degree of trust across this boundary that we need to be able to establish. Equally, the distinction between uh, profile and API, the profile is on the data side, the API is on the audience side. So the profile then, the metadata application profile, if you will, is a selection of appropriate abstractions to encode the scope of what can be described using the data that will be available. The API is a selection of appropriate technologies that give access to the data that's managed using that profile. Some examples, the scope would include things like the classes that are used, the properties and relationships that connect the instances of those classes, and the vocabulary terms that uh, make the ontology more specific. Access, on the other hand, with the API, um, is about the document formats that are available, be that XML, JSON, or other, the URI patterns that are in use for publishing the data and the operations that you can perform using the API, be that uh, create, retrieve, update, delete, or things like browse, uh, search, uh, and similar. One exemplary uh, organization um, that I've been very fortunate to be part of over the last decade um, in terms of publishing APIs uh, is AAAF. And I'm certain that most of, if not all of you, will have seen this slide before, so bear with me. IIIF uh, is a community, first and foremost, that develops APIs. There we go, APIs. Um, it implements them in software and it uses that software to expose interoperable content. There are four IIIF APIs, image, presentation, authentication, and search. But here's the point. They focus entirely on media and not on data. They focus entirely on presentation of that media, not on interpretation of data um, for research. It's even in the name. We used to call the presentation API the metadata API back in version 1.0 days, and we renamed it for version two because we realized that we are focusing not on providing access to metadata or data. It is how can we drive a viewer to present media, and now in version three, including uh, video and audio, to an end user such that they, the human, understand the objects that have been digitized. The focus then has been entirely on the usability of those APIs for software engineers to accomplish their tasks. That has meant that we have various design patterns for our APIs, um, and these patterns are about access, they're not about the data. So uh, the Important ones of the 10, I won't go through them all. Uh, number four, make the easy things easy and the complex things possible. I think this has been one of the most critical ones that we have adopted. It, there should be an easy on-ramp for people to very quickly become productive. And then as they progress through their implementations, they can then layer on additional complexity and additional uh, knowledge when they have time for spending additional resources. And also number eight, Designed for JSON-LD using linked open data principles. So JSON is the lingua franca of web um, developers these days. And linked open data, or the semantic web, has often been a curse word in those circles. So by focusing on the JSON serialization, we make the information usable while still sticking to our principles um, of uh, connecting across institutions and data sets. So why has AAAF been so successful? And importantly, how can we reproduce that success elsewhere? I argue that it is because of this focus on usability and on community. 
the community as a whole has been very responsive um, to itself and to others to enable the software engineers to be productive. By focusing on the usability of the API, then this gives us a correction function for the abstraction layer's tendency towards completeness. There is a trade-off that has to occur here because as the title of the slide says, the API is the user interface of the developer. We need to pay as much attention to the design of the API's usability as we do to web interfaces or any other user interface for mere mortals, people using the data. And we must take note of this for research environments. If we do not reproduce this particular pattern, then we would tend, uh, as previously, towards uh, this correct and complete um, end goal without any concern for usability. And then, if it's not usable, it clearly will not be used. If it is not used, how can it be sustainable? Further, it needs to be consistent. So one of AAAF's um, main reasons, I believe, for success is that his focus also on consistency. There have been tools put into place to be able to validate whether or not people have implemented the APIs uh, in the way that it was intended. There are multiple implementations of clients that can be used to check to see, did I do this right? Rather than just hoping that people read many pages worth of documentation, can then convey that to a software engineer who will then be able to uh, implement it correctly. This has meant that the cost of implementations has been greatly reduced. So not only are there these tools, there is also community, a, a responsive community that can answer questions of software engineers uh, or of users or anyone else when they come up in a very quick amount of time compared to previous uh, days of sending an email to a mailing list and waiting for a week, moving on, and never returning to that particular question. Um, uh, one of my former colleagues at, at Stanford, Tom Kramer, um, who, to whom I owe a, a great deal, um, has been very uh, interested and in, in, is interesting in this uh, respect. Because of two particular projects uh, that have come out of uh, his team. The first, uh, formerly called Hydra, um, now called Samvera, um, is essentially selling a product, uh, a particular digital library software uh, implemented um, in Ruby. AAAF, also coming um, out of a Stanford project, instead focuses not on the implementation, but on these APIs. So it can sell community with lots of interoperable products rather than a single product um, and a single technology stack. One of the other important uh, design patterns for AAAF is to not introduce unnecessary technology dependencies. This focus on usable, consistent APIs to give access to the backend correct complete data gives us this sustainability pattern. So if we replicate this pattern multiple times across multiple institutions, we then have uh, audiences that we need to serve using it. So I believe that there are four primary categories of audience. And remember, these are not who, but why. So uh, these categories are, are humans, machines, the network, and research. And I believe that these categories build upon each other in an incremental fashion. We can start at the bottom and work our way up. We can start with data for humans, or strings, um, work our way down towards data for research. So data for humans, then, uh, is separated entities, so the, the object separated from a person, separated from a place, with attached textual descriptions that could be displayed to a human, and the human can read the text and understand what's going on. So this is essentially the manifest uh, from the AAAF uh, APIs. Then uh, data for machines, or structured data. Um, here the entities have machine processable values, so these values would be things like dimensions, not as a string, uh, but as a, a number and a, a unit, a, and a unit. That you can then compare five inches of, uh, of one small statue to uh, 15 feet for a very large statue. 
From there, we can go on to, if you'll forgive me, distributed or data for the network. And here, the entities uh, have the same um, structured data, the same human interpretable data, but are connected across systems and across institutions. So here the data is to enhance the network effect so that we can find other data and benefit from other institutions' knowledge. Finally, once we have the network effect up and running, then we can focus on stringent data or data for research. Here, the data needs to have sufficient accuracy and be present in sufficient quantity that we can answer research questions after aggregating that data together. Sorry, there we go, the screen froze. Um, so I believe that there are five Cs uh, for research data, much like uh, the five Cs of diamonds. Uh, however, uh, unlike color, clarity, cut, and so forth, these are uh, consistent. Uh, the data must be consistent across implementations and across institutions. The data must be connected for that network effect uh, to take place. Um, I know that this is a cliche these days, but we are all on this together. Uh, it must be collaborative. We will not succeed um, doing this all by ourselves. We have to uh, work on collaborative products and projects. That must be correct and complete enough. You know, it can't have many, many, many errors, uh, otherwise the research will not uh, be successful. But we can't prevent that from letting us move forwards. Uh, and um, it must be contextualized. So this one I'd like to highlight uh, because I believe the others are relatively straightforward. So contextualized data uh, is important because the users must understand the environment in which the data exists sufficiently well to have confidence, another C, I realize, in their use of the data. Can they put the data to use to their own end? I think there are two primary factors that I've heard um, in this realm uh, that we could consider. The first uh, is data provenance. So who created data, when, why, and what situations, and so forth. There has been a tendency to try to put this into the data itself, but I do not believe that that's necessary. Instead, I think that we can have a description of this intended to be readable by humans per data set. Why? Because the publishing institution's reputation is almost certainly more important than any documentation that they could put out. If the Getty is a reasonably well-respected organization, puts out some data, and another organization that no one has ever heard of published exactly the same data, our data would almost certainly be treated as more reliable than the other data. And no, I haven't seen any uh, studies of this. If anyone has, please let me know. I would be fascinated. So secondly, uh, is about uncertainty of assertion. So this is really the confidence of the publishing institution in their own data. So a, uh, a, use, a user um, should not feel more confident in the data than the publisher is, perhaps. The issue is that this is going to need to be at the data level. It needs to be present so that uh, it can be taken into account during aggregation. However, this drastically reduces usability if it's accessible for that sort of computation. So here we have this completeness problem again. Is there a solution? I believe there is. I believe it is not technical, but social. Although uh, Cliff, um, in his introduction, um, praised my work on digital human and digital humanities, I'm not sure that that's uh, warranted. Uh, my feelings about digital humanities is instead that we should be thinking of it more as corpus humanities than digital humanities. We don't need perfect certain data. We just need to ask corpus appropriate questions of the large amounts of imperfect data that we actually have access to. We should be looking for broad beam illumination of patterns in the data rather than laser focused specific research questions. This approach would minimize the challenges of the uncertain data and whether or not we can publish that uncertainty along with the data and maximize the benefits uh, of the network effect by being able to gather large amounts of information together, admittedly imperfect and uh, incomplete. 
particularly in humanities, this is important, and in things like art history that are both historical, adding to the uncertainty, uh, and subjective. If I say this is a genre painting, does that mean anything? Does that mean anything to you? Uh, who knows? So the fact that me as a potential digital humanist has described it doesn't, uh, shouldn't lead you to much confidence compared to an art historian. And art historians, as uh, anyone will tell you, will also come up with at least as many answers as to the style or genre of uh, many objects. So onto uh, sustainable access to large amounts of imperfect data. I, there were three possible options uh, for this, I believe. Uh, the first one, um, so we could uh, have a single centralized platform that we all agree upon. In my notes say to pause for incredulous laughter. I'm imagining 158 people giggling slightly at that. Uh, or we could have a distributed ecosystem in which every institution participates to their own ability. So to one of those uh, four degrees of uh, intended audience. I believe that the first one, uh, the, the centralized platform model, uh, is ultimately not scalable. We will have so much information available via all of the cultural heritage and research institutions that we would strip the capacity of any single system to manage all of it. It's also, as Kathleen Fitzpatrick so clearly uh, argued and described in her keynote uh, last spring, any centralized platform is prone to being commercialized. So taking an open system and making uh, it only profitable um, via a paywall to being shut down because they do not want to do that and don't have the resources to sustain it or in some other way exclusionary, which we do not want. So on to the, the other two. My first CNI um, was in spring of 2004 uh, when uh, Ray Denenberg, Jenny Walker and myself presented the uh, NISO MetaSearch uh, initiative and um, building on top of SIU and, and SRW to be able to distribute queries around the web, retrieve the result sets, merge the result sets and display, uh, and display those results to the, the user. Uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time, um, but similar sorts of uh, time, there was also things like Google, uh, the beginnings of Europeana, uh, OIPMH was going strong, uh, which has then led to resource sync. So given that, uh, Unlike uh, Bryn and Page, I'm now not worth $50 billion. Um, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but really it wasn't. Uh, and instead, we should be looking to solutions that have individual institutions publishing their own data separately, and then many organizations, rather than the singleton Google, um, harvesting that data and building custom specific search and research uh, platforms on top of it. In this space, I've been asked uh, in the past um, the difference between two four-letter acronyms, FAIR and LOUD. Uh, FAIR comes from Force 11. Um, I'm sure that uh, everyone at CNI will have heard this term before. Um, so findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. I feel that these are functions of the system, mostly, other than reusable, which is clearly license-based. Um, as opposed to loud, linked, open, usable data, uh, which is features of the data. So linked, it's connected, open, it's reusable, usable, it's usable, and data is, well, data. So while we're in the practice of creating ungoogleable uh, acronyms for things, I would like to pro propose one more. How about research ecosystems being shared? So sustainable, clearly, Harvestable, available, reconciled, enhanced, and discoverable. And this is going to be the remaining third of the, of the presentation as uh, running through these um, features. So if we are really part of the knowledge industry, then we should be treating our knowledge assets as core assets of our and for that, they need maintenance and they need appropriate governance structures. The same way that we have 
maintenance um, and conservation, the same way that we have facilities that looks after our buildings, the same way we have conservation and cleaning for our museum objects, we need these exact same things for our data. We need to ensure that it is available, usable, accessible, and so forth. This means that we need to be changing our mindset from data being the outcome of a project to data being an ongoing and sustained product of the institution, an asset that we need to invest in rather than to leave to gather digital dust. This, of course, needs uh, different governance structures. I think there is one um, project, uh, if you will, uh, one initiative uh, which is exemplary in this regard, which is the Philadelphia Museum of Arts Art Information Commons project. So yes, a project, but wait, it is a project to, um, a planning project uh, for, funded by the Mellon Foundation to determine how to embed data and knowledge work as a critical component within the institution. The project is about demonstrating the possibilities to change hearts and minds within the institution such that at the end of the project, there isn't just data which is left to rot, but there is a change of culture within the organization such that the data won't rot, such that they can then go on to do things like reconciliation and enhancement. Because without these initial governance structures, there is no chance that the data will be usable. Or indeed, this is the alternative. The Brazilian National History Museum spent 200 years not investing in infrastructure. And the result is the total destruction of the uh, museum and its uh, collections. They didn't even have working sprinklers. This is the outcome if we do not invest in infrastructure. So in order to redirect resources into this infrastructural work, in order to be able to treat data as an asset, these changes need to be in the self-interest of the institution. I believe that they are because as we publish data, we can then increase our institutional reputation by ensuring the use of that data. Institutional reputation or global brand awareness, if you will, then can derive financial revenue from philanthropy, ticket and product sales. This is exactly the same reason why the football coach is the highest paid member of staff at many institutions. It's not that the football coach contributes anything to the research outcomes of university. It's not that the income from ticket sales is a significant impact. It's the next step. It's the first degree of separation. It's the brand awareness of the university through its football team that makes that so important. And this is currently reasonably costly for the museum space because we do not have these standards. But, like we've seen with IIIF, once we get over this initial startup phase, and if the system is adopted internally, a very important part, then we will be able to benefit from the same practices that we have with IIIF. Of course, we'll still need to prove it, but without those television viewing uh, audience statistics uh, that football teams love to, to throw around. Which, of course, means metrics. So in 2018, the Open Data Institute published a white paper um, about the sustainability uh, of uh, data platforms. They had three particular ways to track uh, data usage. First uh, was user tracking. The issue with user tracking is a lack of openness. Um, it's also a barrier to entry in that if you have to sign up uh, for an account or get an API key, then you have put one more barrier in the way of a um, software engineer trying to do something with your data and they will move on to the next one. The second option was just use GitHub, e.g. put the data into GitHub, use GitHub's ecosystem of um, forks and pull requests and watches and stars to track the metrics around the use of the data. Another uh, perceived enhancement was just that people can submit pull requests to change the data in, this, in, um, in the GitHub methodology. The issue with that is the lack of synchronization between the data published to GitHub 
and the backend system that is the system of record maintaining that information. By the time there is a pull request on the export in GitHub repository, the internal system of record will have moved on and you will not be able to integrate back again. The third option was data citations uh, via web searching, um, which of course has exactly the same challenges as all scholarly communication. What is the impact of a publication? However, I would argue, it's much easier in this case because we do not need to demonstrate the value of a particular researcher or a particular data set, a particular paper. All we need to do is demonstrate a positive feedback loop to the institution. Remember, this is about driving the reputation, the global brand awareness of the institution, not of the data set. So by simply linking back from the Getty vocabularies, um, okay, openly published data back to the Getty, rather than to the particular term, we can see, oh, we published this data, now we're getting more hits on our website, which is where we can advertise um, our exhibitions. This means that, that, that citability or citation is a better metric for sustainability um, than pure openness, which is perhaps controversial. However, I think Dan Cohen expressed this um, the best back in uh, 2013 when he was at DPLA. He has a CC0 plus buy, meaning it should be CC0, so legally open and licensing wise unrestricted use, but it should be moving from legal into the social space uh, for the citation. So legally open, but ethically sourced. Okay, so I'm running close to time, so moving on. Um, harvestable for H. So here we have um, the method of constructing the ecosystem from the individual publications. Um, and the harvesting method needs, as an API, to be usable. So this diagram, and I won't go through the details, uh, is a, a layout of the IIIF um, change discovery API, which is uh, in the works. The important thing to note is this metadata box that I've highlighted there. This metadata is real metadata, not just presentation data. So here, by using the presentation ecosystem, we can start to bootstrap our research ecosystem on top of it. Because the search indexes there in the middle are search indexes over top of metadata, not over top of presentation data. The viewer UI goes back to the manifest. So therefore you come back to see the object in a nice environment, but the searches take place over the structured comparable network enriched data. A is pretty obvious and a useful vowel for the acronym. I'll touch briefly on the second two points there. So we need caching uh, and replication infrastructure to be implemented. Um, so this is for performance, but also for preservation. Uh, we need to ensure that the data is available, even if the Getty's network link goes down. Uh, and my social media influencer friends, uh, of whom I have none, um, have informed me that multi-channel publication uh, is the buzzword du jour, um, which essentially means, uh, if I understand correctly, that it is the same knowledge that is available and used um, from the same system, but via very different interactions. So the same, the same source uh, and available via different uh, methodologies. Uh, R for reconciled uh, or reconciliation. Reconciliation, I would say, is the grand challenge of our time. Um, and as this diagram uh, that I put together for a Mellon Foundation um, symposium on reconciliation tries to show, uh, it's very expensive um, to do correctly. So at the moment, Yale, um, under their uh, Vice Provost uh, for Collections and Color Communication, Susan Gibbons, I would say is an exemplary um, institution in this regard, in that they're putting together a three-year uh, program to look at reconciliation across their cultural heritage uh, collections and, uh, and divisions. So the libraries, the archives, multiple art museums, and the Peabody Natural History Museum. Uh, here at the Getty, um, we've adopted the Open Refine platform uh, for two different cases. The first is that our um, catalogers and metadata analysts use it for reconciling our data. 
and we use the Open Refine API to publish the Getty vocabularies such that other people can also do the same thing and to use the Open Refine methodology uh, and, and platform to reconcile data to the AAT. Uh, I think this is where a centralized platform such as Wikidata comes in handy. So Wikidata is essentially a centralized hub for massively distributed QA of crowdsourced reconciliation. It's not good for publishing research quality data because the confidence in that data cannot be very high because anyone can edit it and anyone uh, will edit it if Wikipedia is anything to go by. So instead, we can use the trusted sources, the actual institutions, uh, we can use their data for the reconciliation and use the hub to find it. So this is also about discovery. Uh, enhanced. So I think there are three areas of enhancement that we need to think about. The first is progressive enhancement of our data internally. So if we can get to data usable by humans or strings and then work our way towards research data, um, that's better than simply waiting for the data to be perfect and never getting there. But we also need to accept external feedback and external corrections to our data. We need to allow other people to help us to improve our data. And that needs to have a reasonably fast turnaround because if you submit something and you don't see any change, there is no positive feedback loop to the end user that they should do it again. And hence they won't. And our crowdsourcing platforms such as Zooniverse uh, play on this, uh, particularly using gamification techniques. But here we need another piece of cultural change. We need a greater tolerance for the, both the presence, because we know that these uh, errors exist already, and the introduction of new errors. We need to ensure that those errors can be corrected when they are found, but they are already there. We know they're there and we are okay publishing things today. We just need to double down on that. Once we have doubled down on it, then we can see, and I believe we will see, a dramatic increase in the use of machine learning techniques, such as the ones being investigated in the Pharos Consortium uh, for photo, uh, photo archives, where there is so many objects, such as in any archive, that they cannot be catalogued uh, individually, and they need to be done by machine. Finally, discoverable. If we can't find it, then uh, we have missed the boat. Uh, so harvestability is important. Uh, the connections across the institutions are important. It needs to be part of the web and not just on the web. So the connectedness, but also the use of JSON-LD that plays nicely with web SEO tools. So nowadays, JSON-LD is in more than 25% of all websites around the world. This is a, a now a ubiquitous standard technology that we should be all adopting. Uh, and finally, um, we can look at this um, through a lens of partnerships with industry because the clients and the products also need support and to be sustainable, um, just like the data that uh, we maintain is. I would argue that universities and cultural heritage organizations in particular are not well positioned to support many end users in the same way that the technology industry is. So, uh, in summary, um, we need a shared ecosystem of fairly loud data. I believe that we can get there, um, which be, uh, would be via a consistent um, set of data uh, and implementations using conceptual models, ontologies, and location profiles. These need to balance completeness and correctness versus the usability. Um, and this can be done via a publishing and harvesting ecosystem which is then bootstrapped on existing media and presentation ecosystems that can be used and supported internally as well as externally and in partnership across organizations and across industries. So thank you very much for your time. Um, if you would like to uh, stick around and, and uh, ask questions, I would be greatly uh, appreciative. Um, if you'd like to see these slides, the link there is um, uh, to the slide share and they are linked from um, the presentation page in CNI. Uh, and if you uh, are one of those people who say, uh, don't pass me the mic, I can just shout. Yeah, no, not this time, I'm afraid.
uh, you should definitely use the mic because I will not hear you otherwise. So thank you very much, everyone. Much applause, Rob. The, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I have to say the amount of um, design wisdom that you have packed in there um, uh, is really, people will be digesting this for quite some time. There are many, many important lessons and points in there. Um, and I'm grateful for your ability to look across so many projects and, and tease out where they've gone right and where they've gone wrong as, as part of this. Um, I'd like to invite um, anybody who has questions to hit the Q&A um, button on the bottom of their screen um, and uh, we'll see what comes in. No open questions yet. Um, here, I'll, I'll ask you a quick one um, uh, while people are cogitating. Um, I was really um, fascinated to see um, the um, question of reconciliation of data appear and um, the way you called that out as one of the really key and largely unresolved um, in, indeed, even unre unexplored uh, problems. And um, I have been struck by how many times that comes up now. And um, the, 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 the tensions that show up between reconciliation and various kinds of data flow across institutions and across contexts, um, the problem being you, you, you sort of you reconcile it in one place, but by that time something else has happened to it in another place and you, you can't get back to it. And, and then you've got to, you, you, and then you have to figure out how to reconcile that again. Um, you have any thoughts on how to really kind of do this at, at you know, big ecology scale? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I think, um, the the notion of reconciliation hubs is important um as i as i said there's this uh tendency to think of wikidata as the source of all knowledge or the potential maintainer of all knowledge in the same way that wikipedia is the source of all knowledge um but really i think there is two aspects to it one is discovery of the object um and it's your, or the, the, the identity of the object. You know, so the, the first one, do I know the URI or can I find it somewhere? So if we can't find the URI then you know, to reconcile against, then we can't go any further. So having hubs that focus on collecting and managing pre-reconciled identities and identifiers um, is important. And then, um, Secondly, one thing I didn't mention was that the vocabulary data is data. It's research data, um, particularly for things like uh, ULAN at, here at the GC, uh, the union list of artist names. There is a lot of research that goes into establishing the identity of a person or the identity of a place uh, in TGN. Similarly, in uh, every other vocabulary. So if we apply the same principles, uh, to the for the instance data to the vocabulary data and use the same ecosystem for managing it including sustainability harvestability availability reconciled against other vocabularies enhanced across um, the domain and easily discoverable then we can ensure that there is good access to the data which will then improve the ability for people to more cheaply reconcile their data. So sharing, first sharing the, the reconciliations broadly so that not everyone has to do it um, and publishing the data that enables that reconciliation to take place uh, in the first place. I think those are the uh, two critical uh, aspects. I think um, this is going to be more of a snowball effect that 
Uh, now there's some reconciled uh, systems, some reconciled data, but as there's more and more, um, then the hubs will start to appear and we will see it becoming easier and easier to reconcile um, systems into those uh, core vocabularies. Interesting. Thank you, um, Cliff, for the question. That's a really fascinating question. So we got one in here. Um, the issue that's raised is fair data and the notion of fair data doesn't really capture ethical dimensions very much. Yeah. Um, how do, when, when you think about um, uh, um, memory institutions, archives, museums, cultural memory institutions, um, how do you, they, they, they of course have, um, have very strong ethical considerations around their data. Um, and uh, I think um, generally are very mindful of those considerations. Um, in, in the kind of world you're envisioning, you actually see a lot of corporate partners um, coming into, uh, into play as well. How do, you, um, how do you see sorting the various ethical and motivational incompatibilities there? Yeah. Yeah, th I think, I, think I got that question right. Someone will tell me if I didn't. <laughs> um, so I think there's, uh, the, the Smithsonian said this uh, well recently with um, their publication of um, millions of, of images and, and data sets that they have tried to publish openly everything that should be open, but that's not everything. Not everything should be open. Um, uh, one of the um, collaborations that I've been part of in the past, uh, the Indigenous Digital Archive, uh, it was a, a project in New Mexico um, with 20 of the tribes there mm -hmm. uh, to take the digitized archives that are held at NARA uh, and publish them such that the history of the tribes um, and some of the injustices, the great injustices that they suffered, um, would be part of uh, the understanding of, of the community. However, uh, and here the, the predatory businesses can, can really um, come in, some of those records really cannot be open because they included things like uh, medical tests of students in the Indian schools. Some of those could be traced back to genetic issues, which would then impact present day people who are alive and potentially an insurance company scraping all of this data, mining through it would say, oh, we know who that person is and we know that this person is a customer. We are going to suddenly deny them coverage, not because of a pre-existing condition of that person, but of, a, pre of a, a long past existing condition of one of their ancestors. Similarly, there are many different cultural traditions about openness um, of images and openness of content uh, that we desperately need to be more aware of uh, when it comes to this, uh, this side of things. So when I talk about uh, industry as a partner, um, I'm thinking more along the lines of the IIIF um, uh, community and also of, of the Semfira community and similar, where there are partners who are for profit that are part of the community, not merely interlopers. Um, so by having APIs uh, and consistent data structures that can be um, published using open source software and commercial software that can be consumed using open source software or commercial software, we can um, ensure that any predatory uh, mm -mm, uh, its organizations would not have the vendor lock-in that um, other technology companies in the current uh, era have. So it's not that I want a Facebook, quite the opposite. Uh, it's uh, 
that I want there to be partners such as the Jurati um, or such as uh, DCI in, um, in the San Fierro community that behave in a respectful way and can use the um, openly agreed upon standards to, um, to derive a profit for providing a service. So this is sort of the W3C model where you get Google and IBM and Mozilla and Microsoft and you, know, you name it. They all come to the table and they all agree amongst themselves, or you get here as a member as well, of course, um, about standards and then go off and implement them separately and advertise their own products. But at the end of the day, without that standard, there isn't a market that can be moved forwards. So I think I do believe that we need both um, cultural heritage organizations, research organizations, and industry partners um, to ensure the sustainability of all parts of the ecosystem. So that's a very important distinction about the nature of par the partnerships. Yeah. You know. um, we have another question in about um, the, uh, w uh, the extent to which um, rightstatements.org uh, URIs can help um, with uh, with this ecosystem, um, there's a there there's quite a bit of mismatch about the willingness of, or, or let's not say mismatch, but um, inconsistency about the willingness of institutions to provide broad access to collections. Some of them are really worried about copyright issues. Others feel they're on much safer ground there. Um, do you think that um, these sorts of more flexible approaches to um, dealing with right statements than the sort of very simple partitioning up of the world um, that um, uh, Creative Commons license do are gonna be important here? Yes, definitely. Um, I think the, uh, yeah, the, the very good work that the rightstatements.org uh, folks did, and it was, if I recall correctly, Europeana and, and DPLA is two of the primary uh, participants in I that. So. Um, were, uh, you know, they looked at some uh, 80,000 different right statements uh, to try to find what are the commonalities uh, in those statements and derived uh, on the order of, of 15 or 16 such things, including things like no known copyright. So uh, they, the organization is, assert, is asserting with that one that they looked for copyright and they couldn't find any. So they don't, it's not that they're saying this is public domain, it's that they're saying here is an object for which we do not believe there is copyright, but we could be wrong. Or similarly, copyright not assessed, I forget exactly the, the terminology used for that one, is we're putting this out there, but if we didn't even look. If there's copyright, you tell us and we'll take it down uh, kind of approach. So I think this, uh, there are two good, very, very good things about this. One is it's a small vocabulary, right? There is 15 or 16 terms, each of which has an identity, an identifier, a URI, that can be used in data and it will always mean the same thing. So this is that comparable layer. This is data for machines not the 80,000 different right statements, which would be data for humans. So then, now we can start to build interfaces and automated processing systems that rely on the presence of that identifier and can behave differently in the different, the 15, 16 different cases. So yes, I, I fundamentally um, agree that by annotating our data with rights assertions that are comparable, in this way, we will move the system overall forwards um, dramatically. Hopefully then, uh, to, the, to Melissa's question and uh, point, um, that will mean that there'll be more confidence from the publisher's side that what they're doing is part of this broader ecosystem and they're not sort of uh, the tall poppy and the lawnmower is coming to, um, to knock, their, knock them down. Thank you for that, thank you for that question. Um, let's take one more question, if there is one. I think you have left people 
pretty speechless, at least. <laughs> um, thank you.